Hi everyone, I'm Jody Cotter and welcome to another episode of A Little Slice of Wellness. So, you know, this is a podcast where I talk to interesting people about their stories, typically centering on psychology, mental health, wellness and spirituality. So, okay, for this month's slice, I am joined by Amanda Wagley, a mental health advocate and consultant who works primarily educating both the public and mental health professionals in voice hearing. Um, the, important thing, the important thing to note is that Amanda herself speaks from the experiences of voice hearer. Welcome to the podcast, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> no Joe. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for welcoming me to, you to, me to your home. And most of all, for providing the bowl of cheesels. You must, right. you must have seen the first episode and gone I this. Have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, you know, Amanda, before I maybe um, ask you or, you know, to, to introduce yourself and a little bit about your history um, of, of your journey through voice hearing, you know, I find that the term voice hearing itself is a very um, interesting choice of words. Can you perhaps, you know, explain a little bit about how come voice hearing and not schizophrenia or auditory hallucinations and I suspect that the term itself is very important. It is, yeah, and that's a great question. I guess um, within the lived experience movement, mm -hmm. we like to use plain English. Sure. <laughs> um, not big sort of pathologising words. Yep. Um, and also I think it's quite empowering to uh, use words that describe more of what the experience is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that helps uh, the voice hearer themselves, but it also can help others to understand exactly what's going on. Yeah. We were having a bit of a conversation before even the podcast started about this whole thing versus, you know, voice hearing versus hallucinations, right? And, you know, it's, it's kind of my view that the very term auditory hallucination suggests that it's not real or it's not a part of everyday reality, and yet the, the opposite is true for people like yourselves. Yeah, I guess the experience is real and, and it's very real for mm -hmm. a person and definitely auditory hallucination um, is a medical term that usually means it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's not real. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, Amanda, I don't know a lot about your story other than what I've kind of um, read through the, the internet, um, some of the work that you do. Um, especially through the voice hearing network, which I suspect we'll get into a little bit kind of later. Yeah. Um, what's your story with regards to voice hearing? Like, you know, um, take us through um, the point when you actually started hearing voices, and maybe even before. I don't know. What, yeah. what, what's the story? Um, and it's a, it's a big question because, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a big life that I've led. Um, but uh, I guess it started in childhood for me. Okay. And, um, yeah, I didn't have... Uh, it was a pretty rough childhood. And um, I, I don't recall hearing voices uh, until my early teens. And at that time, I was uh, in an institution. And things at home weren't, weren't going so well. And so uh, I was in, in uh, institutional care and... Uh, whilst I was in there, I was abused and it was very um, traumatic for me to um, have that experience. And I guess I was, I was very, very young, very vulnerable uh -huh. and trying to make sense of, you know, um, my, my situation. And it was not long after that abuse took place that um, I... I believe that I first started to hear a voice. I remember feeling um, quite desperate and um, and alone, um, scared, mm. and uh, yeah, a lot of like hurt. Um, I guess I was I was trying to work out who to trust, who not to trust, and um, I started to hear the voice of it was was more like a. A motherly sort of guardian um, angel, yeah, right. that w really um, was comforting to me um, at a time where, yeah, I felt very alone. Was it a familiar voice or voice of someone that you that you know before? Was it a no, totally different it, voice? Yeah, I didn't recognise the voice, but I remember 
um, just feeling overwhelmed with um, peace when okay. I when I heard it. So it was it was quite um, quite comforting. That's a very a, a different um, experience because most of the time in, in psychiatry and psychology, when you hear about people first hearing voices, they are usually scary. Yeah. Um, they you know they they're, they're not really nice experiences for you. It was more of a, of a soothing and a calm. Yeah, in actual fact, I, I think um, it's usually the the bad ones that that get a lot of the attention or okay. that we hear about. But in actual fact, a lot of people hear mm. positive, helpful, guiding voices, um, and they're not they don't cause a problem in their lives. At that time, I wasn't in psychiatry. Um, I was, uh, I guess, a troubled teenager um, trying to make sense of the world and and where I fitted in that world Mm -hmm. but I was also very um, aware that that experience was um, maybe a little bit different so I was quite um, guarded as to who I might tell about that experience because you were still in the um, this institution slash home that you're talking about, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It was not long um, after that that I uh, started to then hear a second voice. And the second voice um, was uh, very different to the first voice mm-hmm. and um, actually was quite um, rebellious um, and it would argue with the first voice. Oh, okay, so now there were, there were two voices having a go at one another in mm, your own head. In my head. So um, that, was, uh, that, that, that was a quite different experience yeah. to just hearing one guiding, uh-huh. comforting voice. So this second voice was... Um, yeah, it, it, where the first voice had my... I, I felt had my um, my best interests at heart and mm-hmm. was really uh, soothing, whereas this other voice was cheeky and, um, you know, would say, don't listen to her. Um, mm. You know, I know what, what you should do. So it would be, uh, they would argue over what was best for me. But this was going on in my head. And it, it kind of, at, at times, that second voice could be quite, um, uh, well, it, was a, it, it liked to take risks and it, it really liked to, um, I guess, challenge me to do almost the opposite. I see. And I think, like, I've heard other voice hearers say that, it, you know, it's sort of like a, um, an angel and a demon. Right. You know, on your shoulder kind of thing. That's the thing. first thing that came to my mind when you said yeah. that. Yeah. So it was, um, although uh, that second voice was not so much like resembling a demon or anything like that, it could get me into, into it, w- it would test me and, and tempt me mm. to do things that I wouldn't ordinarily do. Are you comfortable to saying how so? Like in, in what way? I would. Uh, as a teenager, I took some I took some risks in in areas that okay. I wouldn't normally do, like you know, drink alcohol and drink yep. a lot of alcohol or um, testing the boundaries it, is what our teenagers do. Anyway, yeah, right? it so. is. That's right. And I was at that stage in mm. my life, and I don't think if it wasn't for that that voice, <laughs> kind of gave me a bit bit of courage to you know speak up and do things that I wouldn't normally do. Um, and you're right. At that stage in life, that wasn't that kind of behaviour wasn't seen mm. as being that out there really. Um, but it was. It, fe- it felt like it wasn't me. It was motivated by by her. And and at that time, I was. Um, you know, there were times where I would do things that she would say that I wouldn't normally do, like you know, go out on a on a date with somebody mm. that. You know, I didn't know or, oh. or stuff like that. So, so are, are you saying, Amanda, that you had a thing for bad boys and the, and the, <laughs> and the voices encourage you to go with that bad boys? Well, 
<laughs> yes, that could have happened. Yeah. Yeah. I bet there's a few stories of that, but we're not going to go into that. No, no. Look, if we can just back up a little bit, like, you know, because you started hearing firstly the soothing, calming voice and then later down the track, um, I would say not very long after, yeah? yeah. You, you started hearing this kind of voice that was in, in op, op, that was opposite to this voice and it was rebellious, it was cheeky. You know, for, for those of us who perhaps do not have this experience of living with these clearly audible voices, right? What, what's the, like, could you explain what's the difference between, say, uh, a voice that I have in my head that's not so much a voice, like a thought. So, you know, when, when I look at yeah. that bowl of cheesels, see, it always comes back down to food for me. <laughs> when I look at a bowl of cheesels, you know, part of me is going, like, eat it, eat it, it's, it's, it's really nice, it's really yellow, orange. And another part of me goes, you know, don't, like, you know, you're going to have to do a really long run tonight if, if you do that. But I don't hear it. The, the voices that just occur in my consciousness I suspect that the voices that you're hearing are very different from that. Mm. It, uh, they are, and and uh, it's a great question because people who don't have the experience mm -hmm. don't know what it's like, yeah. and um, and it's hard. It's hard to 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 explain. But I guess if we go with a thought, mm -hmm. um, like I have thoughts, and um, I guess I have a degree of control, like you talk about the cheesels, well, the thought is to eat them, but I can decide whether I, I do. <laughs> whether, I not, whether I do or not. So I, I can, within my mind, have some control over that. Whereas with voices, I can't control them. Okay. So I, I, I guess I can't, what I can't... Um, it's like they're, they're completely uh, se a separate entity um, right. other than my mind and thoughts. Mm. So, I mean, I, I love this because I'm coming from a real place of curiosity here, right? Is this, like, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to kind of articulate myself because I don't yeah. have, I have no point of reference and, and I can imagine for a lot of people who don't hear voices, this is what it's like for them. It, is it audible? It is mm. audible. So, I do hear it mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, it it comes from my head. Um, but Spatially located here. Yeah, yeah. So it's coming out, out of my head. Um, I can sometimes look to the left or look to the right. Like it might feel like it's behind me. Ah. I've had periods where I, I've had objects talk to me as well, like it's come out of the, the television mm -hmm. and things like that. But most of the time it's, you know, it, I guess just like I'm, I would hear your voice. Yeah. But it's, there's nobody there. So that's how I would hear it. Some people oh, okay. say it's like dreaming, um, uh, dreaming and you're awake kind of thing. Um, it's it's kind of it's not just the hearing. It's a it's an all over kind of sensory experience yeah. for me. Um, and I think uh, how people experience it can be very unique and, and different to I each see. person. So it's it's not the same. Yeah, so you can have a thought, but then you can also have a voice, and your voice, your voices, from my experience, can tap into your thoughts okay. and extend on them. Or yeah, so almost it, like it's reading your mind. Yeah, like oh, you just had that thought about that chisel before. Yeah, Amanda, why didn't you eat it? Why did you? Are you talking about it's, that kind of that kind of thing? Oh. Yeah, so it's 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 um, it. It's crazy making in that you can think that, uh, like, you know, it, it's so intrusive. Yeah. You, nothing's private anymore. When you're hearing a voice that's commenting on your thoughts, on your actions, on what you're doing, um, it's, yeah, it, it's very intrusive. I mean, even listening to that, it's kind of, I'm getting goosebumps because you know, I can't imagine having something in my head telling me and commenting on my own thoughts, right? That's like a horror movie for me. But you mentioned the term intrusive. Now, you know, I've obviously seen a lot of people in clinical practice and they speak about intrusive thoughts. Now, I'm, again, listening to what you're saying, the intrusive thoughts and the voices themselves, again, are very different from one another. Yeah, because I think, I, I think a thought is different yeah, from yeah. a voice. And I think that's a big takeaway for me, because sometimes you can get a little bit, for, for us, we don't, we don't experience it, we can get confused between, are, are you thinking it? Are you hearing it? 
Was it yeah. a combination of the both? Yeah. And and I guess it's probably only because I am a voice hearer that I know the difference. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. So it's I guess it's um, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to explain what that's like. Are these the only two voices that have appeared for you in your lifetime? Uh, no, no. But at that time they were, and um, so I um, I actually ended up with a, a, a an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And so that was when I entered into uh, psychiatry briefly um, as, a, as a teenager. And um, I did get some uh, support at that stage. And I don't, I didn't really talk about the voices as such. It was more the, the, uh, the behaviours right. around the eating. It was kind of, it's separate from one another. It, in yeah, one sense, yeah, I didn't, even though I got help, I didn't actually... Um, and a lot of that was um, was really good, really helpful, and it was like about twelve months of of support, mm -hmm. and um, I actually came out the other end feeling a lot stronger, a lot better about myself. Wow! And um, I managed to finish high school, um, which was really helpful to have that to to focus on, mm -hmm. and um, then set out in the big wide world to, you know, um, uh, yeah, to, to, I guess, find a life, create a life for myself. And I actually uh, moved from Victoria to Western Australia and I came over to um, work on the Aboriginal missions up north. This is over 30 years ago. Wow. Um, and I loved, I loved working with children. I loved that, that work and... I was very happy and I wasn't hearing voices. And so they they had kind of, um, yeah, just gone away really. Mm. Um, and I was getting on, getting on with my life and I ended up getting married and having a family and sure. settling here in Perth. And, and uh, yeah, I'd always wanted to be a mum. So, you know, that I was living the dream and uh, raising my family. And, um, yeah, it's very sort of happily married and, and no voices. And that, um, that went on for probably about 12, 13 years mm -hmm. and um, where I didn't experience voices at all. And then some problems started within my marriage and, um, yeah, then they came back. Right. And um, so I... I uh, it was the same two voices, um, but it was the, um, I guess, the one that was not so nice. Mm -hmm. um, it was mainly her rather than the one that was comforting. And at that time I was, uh, so there were some problems within the marriage, and uh, but I was also um, pregnant with my seventh child. Seventh child. My seventh child, yeah. <laughs> and um, you were busy. I was a very, be very, very busy mum, but I actually had a situation where um, a life-threatening situation with a pregnancy, oh. and um, I actually uh, I died on the table, and they uh, had a cardiac arrest. I bled out, and. Um, but prior to that, I was told that this condition that I had, placenta accreta, you know, there was not much chance of, um, not a good chance of me surviving and, and of the child surviving. And so it put a lot of pressure and stress. When I did survive and, come, and came out and my baby survived as well, um, I uh, it, things just felt so different and... Um, the voices were very intense. Mm. Um, there was other voices there. So I had um, postpartum psychosis mm -hmm. and um, then, uh, yeah, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, um, yeah, it was a very, very difficult time um, for not just for myself but for my family. But the voices were... Um, uh, definitely at their worst at that time and I didn't really know what to believe I didn't feel the same you know I'd had a 
a near-death experience and um, it was just a very confusing, distressing time from, in my life. Yeah. So Amanda, you, you spoke about other voices kind of entering into the picture yep. at around this time in your life. Um, what, what were they like? Can I ask that? Yeah, so I, I guess I was, um, I was very religious. I was um, practicing my faith and mm -hmm. I... Which was, if, if we can... Uh, Catholic. Oh, you Catholic, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and I guess I, I was doing a lot of praying mm -hmm. um, and meditation. I was actually in King Edward... Um, hospital and wasn't allowed to leave the bed um, just prior to the to the birth with with this um, condition and so other people were praying for me as well and it was actually quite a, a spiritual time but knowing or being told that you may not live um, yeah it 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 definitely um, was confronting and I was reaching out and, and praying a lot mm -hmm. um, uh, that I could be, could get through this. And I, I know that I had um, heard, uh, heard the voice of, of God, heard the voice of Mary. There was also a saint, um, Saint Jared Magella, who I okay, was yeah. praying to um, and... I had a, I, I mean, to me, spirituality is a connection, and I, and at that time, I had this very strong connection um, with, uh, yeah, with, with God, and so it was like I could hear them talk to me um, uh, at different times and give me messages that you know, of reassurance that everything was going to be okay. However, after I came out of um, ICU, um, what I was hearing was um, very uh, demon, devil-like voices that were saying that, um, I sh you know, I shouldn't have lived mm. and um, that, and and so I, they were, you know, there was this battle again, I suppose. However, the demon devil-like voices um, were saying really horrible, nasty things about me and about what happened. And that, um, I guess, just intensified. And so it was very hard to make, you know, make sense of what, what was going on, these these uh, voices had changed into, yeah. you know, almost sort of morphed into um, what was very uh, kind, guiding, comforting um, voices of, of um, I guess, yeah, people that I, that I really felt that connection to, to all of a sudden these monsters that... Yeah. Um, yeah, and they were saying, you know, telling me that I that I was supposed to die. I should have died. I need to die. Um, that wasn't my destiny, um, you know. And you know, something went wrong. And um, yeah, so I, I had a I had a, a you know a, a, a tiny little baby um, who was fighting for his life. Yes. And I was, you know, recovering physically from the surgery and but also having these experiences that really made me feel like I wasn't properly in this world. Uh, whatever happened, I wasn't the same as I what I was before. You know, it, it's really interesting that when you speak about the voices, there seems to be a dual quality to the voices. Like there always seems to be a good one and then a not so good one comes up to kind of balance that, mm. right? Um, is that the case? I mean, is there, are, are, are there counterparts? Like, so, so that was the case, case for me. For and, and, but I guess these evil demon-like uh, voices, there was lots of them. Right. So it, 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 it kind of, that earlier part of my life, there was just the kind of two voices. Sure. Um, who had unique personalities and um, different traits, 
whereas now this there was more of them. They were un, I guess, yeah, it was hard to to know um, what they were. But I also felt that I was having having a lot of other experiences mm-hmm. other than voices. I was um, other sensory experiences, so I was seeing things, uh, feeling things, uh, smells, taste. Um, everything seemed to be out of whack that what, you know, like smell things that other people couldn't smell or see things that other people couldn't see. So it was like my whole system was, was out out of whack. whack. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I guess it was like, uh, you know, at that time I was, uh, yeah, very much, I was trying to get on with my life. Um, but I just couldn't, and I, I couldn't get a grasp on on uh, what to do about these experiences and to discern um, uh, the messages or what they wanted me to do. So, And I also was very vulnerable again, and I didn't feel that I had the strength to... Um, to say no to them or not do what they wanted me to do and very much they wanted me to die. That sounded like a very dangerous part of your journey. Yeah. So I was, uh, uh, as I said, that was the be- beginning of my psychiatric career mm. um, of uh, being a patient and being a right. consumer of mental health services and going in and out of hospital, large doses of medication and... Um, and yeah, I was a very, very compliant patient. Yep. Um, and did, did the meds help? No. So the meds um, only seemed to make me feel worse. I, I guess the meds at first, um, you know, because I had they to put these other diagnoses on me. The longer I was in the system, the more diagnoses <laughs> I got. You started collecting them. Yeah, yeah. started collecting them. Um, you know, like, for example, uh, once my baby turned one, mm-hmm. it was postnatal depression. It wasn't postpartum psychosis, you know, right, like it, yeah. all these different things, whereas I still felt the same. But I I was embedded into the system. So I was a consumer. I was seeing a psychiatrist. I was going in and out of hospital, taking, always changing meds and basically being told that, you know, I had serious mental illness and would yep. not... Um, be able to, I was put on the disability pension, wouldn't be able to work or do anything. Um, I just had to have a life of being a patient. Sounds pretty bleak. It was. Yeah. It was very difficult. And and I guess the voices are just were just one part of that because I was very depressed, um, you know, and I had those, uh, uh, I guess, thoughts mm-hmm. of taking my life um, and having the thought and then having a voice sort of, give you ideas or, or whatever it was, yeah, there pretty much all the time. But I didn't, I wasn't silly because I knew that even though I was engaging with mental health services, I could talk about my depression, my anxiety, my flashbacks and trauma, and you know, it, but very rarely did I talk and tell them about the voices because when you're in the system and you're in hospital, you know that... The, that's like the end of the line. Right, that's yeah. the that's the um, the worst it can get. And yeah. I saw and witnessed um, what my peers went through who who were having that experience. It wasn't safe to actually tell people that that's what you were having. It's interesting. It's quite different now in in certain respects, right? Because we're actually speaking on the camera now about 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 the very same things that you felt very uncomfortable or or scared about, you know. In this closing, and yeah, I, I, I can see it. it must be so lonely to have been in that, you know, especially if these voices are such a, a big part of your life um, and you just can't talk about it. I'm sorry you've had to go through something like that. that that's horrible. Not the voices so much, but rather the, the way that you were kind of marginalized and you know, just pushed to the side. That's yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it was hard, and it was hard to. The only people at that time I really felt a connection or alignment with was my peers, mm-hmm. was the other patients. Um, the, my, it was very difficult for my husband and, and family um, and children. It was very difficult for everybody to, 
to see what I was like before yep. and, and then to see me like this. And nobody knew what to do. I mean, my um, it was kind of like I'd just go to my doctor and, you know, take my medication. That was, that was all that you could do. And um, it was uh, after many years of that that actually I first started to hear about the Hearing Voices um, uh, Network Mm -hmm. and Hearing Voices Groups. And I was, I think I was very much like, I'm not a voice hearer. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, still very much in denial. What what label were you putting onto yourself at that point in time? Um, I think uh, I had a, I had a diagnosis of bipolar um, at that time and... Yeah, it was it was very much like, well, I'm a consumer, you know, yeah. I'm a patient. That was part of my identity. And so hearing about hearing voices groups, I was like, oh, yeah, all right. But they said anybody could come along. It was open to anybody. And, like, people would say, I don't know if I'm a voice hearer. And they'd say, oh, well, come and have a listen, you know, come yeah. and join the group sort of thing, mm. because, you know. And there was people that I knew that were there and stuff like that. And that gave me the confidence um, go into the group, which was which was hard, but it. I met kind of like my tribe. I met other right. other voice hearers. I listened to their experiences and thought, yeah, that's that's very much what's happening to me. And um, yeah, it was a safe space to be able to talk about my experiences. So yes, it is very lonely to go through those experiences and not have somebody to talk to about yeah. them. And so the groups gave me that opportunity to be able to um, just be myself. Sure. And that was just transformational. Just I could actually talk about it and I could talk about some really bizarre experiences that I would be having and everybody just normalised and accepted it and mm. that was okay. I wasn't, you know, oh, perhaps you should take your meds or perhaps you should go there. It was just, <laughs> you know, should you bring your doctor or anything like that? It was like, no, I could talk and I could actually talk about what, what was going on and, and get that validation and acceptance. So it was transformational in my life and really um, opened doors for me to hear other voice hearer stories and hear about more about the Hearing Voices movement <laughs> And the approach and was able to say, hey, that's for me, you know, there's yeah. there's another option. Psychiatry had given me this, you know, painted this picture of this is what was my life was going to be like. And I, you know, I knew there was something more and the Hearing Voices Movement gave me something more. Mm-hmm. So it, it said there's a way, if you want to work on your voices, if you want to, you know, work through this stuff, There's tools and there's a way to do it.